Hey, it's Illuminostic. Over the last couple of months, I've gotten a lot of questions about the nature of spirits, whether I think they're real or not. And so I've decided to tell the story of the Skeleton Man, which is probably one of my strangest stories, and also one that is backed by the most independent proofs. There's a Facebook group about the Skeleton Man that's got absolutely nothing to do with me. And there is video proof that the story actually went where this spirit told us it was going exactly according to the timeline that we were told that it would. So do me a favor, hit the like button, share, subscribe, support us on Patreon. I want to apologize if you've been watching out for the uh, Psychedelics Masterclass and the patron only content. It is all complete, but we have a problem with the new camera and our current laptop. So until we can resolve that, we're going to attempt to use the phone and um, hopefully we'll come up with a solution quickly and we'll get those videos out which are completed. Okay, so the story of the Skeleton Man. There are a lot of stories and legends from all over the planet regarding a spirit that inhabits the crossroads that oftentimes maybe has horns, um, Hermes and the devil, uh, Thoth in Egypt or the Egyptian Hermes, the Eshu in the African traditions, and the Hopi Skeleton Man. I can't remember the actual name for this particular spirit. And this is the incarnation of this particular archetypal uh, manifestation of consciousness that we suspect that we were dealing with. So in order to put the story into context, I have to talk a little bit about the Grateful Dead, who if you follow my videos, you've probably noticed has been a huge influence on my life. And not only the music, but also the concept. They really did function in such a way that they put the collective ahead of the individuals. They paid their roadies six figures a year when you know a bigger band like Aerosmith at the time was paying their roadies $9 an hour. Everyone had equal vote at board meetings with the exception of Jerry Garcia who was the leader. He could overrule the entire organization. But aside from that, the janitor, for example, once vetoed the signing of a contract. So this new consciousness that is coming, I think these guys were kind of progenitors of that and they proved that it could actually work this sort of hybrid of socialist thinking and capitalist thinking. And on a more mystical level, the band, when they improvised, and this is an idea that's also present in North Indian music and some other styles, but the band and the audience would become one mind, and these improvisations would take on characteristics that were extraordinary. Uh, the music would become impossible in a technical sense, and it was different every night. Also, when these this union of band and audience and this energy happened. There was this release of energy that was capable of inducing the gnosis in people. And I noticed very early on that the dead were not really singing about love your brother and we're all one mind. Their, their message was not lyrical. They were singing about gambling and murder and whatever. But somehow the essence of their consciousness came through the vibrations of their music and they had a tremendous impact on their audiences, which is, of course, were massive. Even in the 70s, they were drawing crowds of up to 100,000 people. Speaking of this energy and this consciousness raising force, the Grateful Dead actually claimed that there was some sort of spirit or intelligence. They didn't claim to know exactly what it was. It didn't always show up, but they just referred to it as it. And they said it had kind of chosen them as its keepers. As a young man at the age of like 21, I decided that I was going to try to become an avatar of this consciousness. And I was already a musician, but I wanted to do what the Grateful Dead had done and use music to elevate consciousness and unify the counterculture or make some contribution to doing so. And so basically I packed up and left and headed out to California where I felt was the mecca of this kind of energy so that I could find like-minded souls more easily. And after I put my first band together, there were some indications that I actually might have the ability to do this kind of lofty thing that I had anticipated for myself or that I had imagined for myself. For example, at our first show with my first serious band, uh, people were coming out between the set and they were saying really strange things. One guy I remember was very pale and shaky and his eyes were kind of bugged out and he said, uh, I said, what would you think? And he said, I'll never see anything the same way again, man. And I was like, wow, that's weird. You know, it's not the normal, like, hey, great show, man. Thanks a lot. It was way more intense than that. And another guy came up to me and said something like, I haven't seen anything like that since Garcia in 1974. And it took me a few months to 
replay this memory in my head and realize this guy had compared me to my hero in his prime. And it's not that I really thought that was a totally apt comparison, but it was at least an indication that I was getting close to this energy that I was after. And so uh, this kind of, I guess, reviews or feedback continued, but that band broke up and that was actually in Colorado and I continued the rest of the way out to California. There were a number of other developments over the years that made me inclined to feel like I could actually do this thing. And one of those is that I got to know the bass player from the Grateful Dead fairly well. I actually ended up sitting with him and his wife and watching their kids' first performance. Some of this conversation with Phil probably bears repeating here. Uh, I wanted to ask him, because I wanted to hear directly from the horse's mouth, about the telepathy that the band claimed to experience on stage. They had actually gone so far as to say that on high doses of LSD they had been able to look out of each other's eyes and actually inhabit each other's bodies and including people out in the audience and this was something that was reported from audience members as well. So I asked Phil, this telepathy thing, it's a literal truth. It's not just like a marketing gimmick and he looked me dead in the eyes and he said no it is absolutely true but you have to be listening with the entirety of your being. And he said, I'll tell you something Charles Mingus told me, you have to get out in front of it. And it took me a while to understand what he meant by that, and I'll let the music nerds and musicians out there mull that one over and figure it out for yourselves. Another interesting thing that Phil said to me during that conversation was that he felt that I was thinking about all of this so deeply and dialed in enough. He said, the torch that we dropped, no one has picked it up yet, and I wouldn't be surprised if you were the guy. This was maybe a couple of months before this phone call from the representative of the Skeleton Man. It was a number of years before I would really get another serious band going. But <clears throat> one day, I was sitting at home, I had no band, and I was wondering if I could really be an avatar for this kind of consciousness, if it was even a real thing, you know, perhaps I was delusional, basically an existential crisis of doubt. And so, I had put an ad in Craigslist looking for work under an assumed name because this is Northern California. Everything is illegal. Every name's an alias. <laughs> and the phone rings. And so I'm assuming that it's, it's, it's work. And this guy says, hey, can you meet me at the convenience store down the street? And I, I said, sure. And I drive down and there's this hippie, this really tall hippie guy leaning up against the car. And I, I get out of the car and walk up to him. And the first thing he says to me is, are you aware that the Grateful Dead was as much of a force as they are a band? And I was like, yeah, man, I, I get the dead. I understand what they were doing. And he said, okay, well, this is going to sound kind of crazy. And I said, well, you know, I can probably handle it. What's going on? And he said, well, I met this 10 foot tall uh, talking skeleton that smokes a corncob pipe. My wife and I, who had corroborated this and claimed to have seen this thing as well, uh, we call him Mr. Mojo. And when I saw your ad on Craigslist, I heard his voice tell me to call you and tell you the following. And so, I'm like, oh, what? And so, and this guy, you know, he was kind of like NorCal's answer to Sling Blade. He was quite the character. But he goes on to tell me that he told me to tell you that ever since Garcia died in 1995, he's been roaming the earth looking for a new avatar. And that you need to get it together because you are working on a timeline. The band will have a nine month incubation just like a human child and once it's born it will be three years before it fully spreads its wings and takes off. And he proceeded to tell me that Mr. Mojo or the Skeleton Man had also told him that I needed to be careful of my public image. We didn't want another situation like Garcia with very public heroin problems and chain smoking and having this kind of negative influence on people that idolized him, etc, etc. So, <clears throat> we, this conversation continues for just a few minutes. I'm, of course, taken aback a bit because this is exactly what I was thinking about when I got his phone call, and so this random stranger just happens to have this incredibly bizarre story for me. So I'm a bit shell-shocked, but I go home and I'm thinking, well, if there really is a collective mind, just because I've established some kind of loop with this random stranger doesn't actually mean that a 10-foot talking skeleton spirit has come and given him a message to relay to me. And of course, I'm very skeptical, so the reason that the skeleton man wouldn't have come directly to me is because I would have dismissed it maybe as my own imagination. The way that it manifested, I think, was much more convincing.
I may have actually encountered the Skeleton Man a number of years before all of this happened as well. I was at a concert in Telluride, Colorado, and I was not on any kind of psychedelic or anything, and I looked up at the clouds and I saw what appeared to be the shape of a reclining skeleton with such detail that it was as if a highly skilled artist had drawn it in the sky. And the strangest thing about this is that while I was looking at it, this guy walks up and without even looking up, he didn't look at the cloud even, he just knew and he said, yeah, he's been here all night and then he kept walking. As I mentioned, I didn't have a band. So I was going to go out to this farm to live with a friend of mine that happened to play the drums. And so I go out to talk to him about the specifics of this project that we're going to be doing together. Not a musical project, but you know, other work. And he shows me a video of this bass player who is like the most phenomenal bass player I've ever seen in my life. Just absolutely extraordinary. And he says, oh yeah, we can get this guy to play with us. And I said, I seriously doubt that. That Why would this guy, he could play with anyone. Why would he play with us? And so he said, well, I've, I've known him since I, he was 12, you know, 20 years. And we played together in all these bands. And, you know, sure, he'll come and play with us. So about a week after that, this bass player in question drives his car into a flood, totals his car, no longer can get to work in the Bay Area, can't pay his rent, and he has no choice but to move in with guess who? This drummer and myself. So suddenly, I have a band. This is a week or so, maybe 10 days after the Skeleton Man. And not only that, we live together, we have no neighbors, so we can literally practice 50 or 60 hours a week, which is what we did. But what do we do? We have no monitors, we have no sound system, we have no microphones. Without even asking, random people started bringing gear over to the house. Prompted by what? I, there's no good answer for that. Uh, at one point, a few months later, we blew up the PA and the neighbor from up on the hill comes by. He's not even a musician, just drops off a PA without being asked. So the entire time, it kind of seemed like this thing was just kind of manifesting against, you know, seriously improbable odds because we had no money to buy this equipment and even if we broke something it would just manifest again within I think it was two or three days after the PA blew up that our neighbor mountain man just happened to roll up in the front yard and say hey I thought you guys could use this um, okay so let's see where is this going from here um, okay and then things start to get a little bit weirder so there's one bar in this town that we happened to or that we tended to play quite often and one day the bass player and I were walking out and of course they were aware of the Skeleton Man story and they knew what my agenda was with trying to create this music that catalyzes consciousness and the whole story. So we're walking out one day and a girl stops us and says, can I tell you what you taught me about music today? So I say, sure. And she says, well, and this is the condensed version. It was extremely eloquent, but it probably went on for 10 minutes. So we don't have time even if I could recreate it. But I was stunned by her delivery. But the gist of what she was saying is sometimes people attain a certain level of consciousness and when they're playing music, even if they're not singing about it, it can come through the music and raise all the people in the audience to that level of consciousness. And I was just blown away because I was thinking, huh, that is a description that the Deadheads made of the Grateful Dead's music. I set out to do the same thing and lo and behold, here is a complete stranger telling me that this music has taught her this lesson that the Grateful Dead taught me. And so a few days later it happened again. I go to the same bar. I was trying to buy a guy a beer and I realized I only had a few bucks and this other guy at the bar said, hey, I'll pay for your beer, man. You're that guitarist. Can I tell you something, man? I never understood the Grateful Dead, but one day you were playing one of their songs and the whole audience and you and the band became like a telepathic entity. It was like you were pulling information out of another dimension. You know, it just went on and on and I'm like, holy shit balls, you know? So then I go to a party a few days later and I play a song and this kid jumps up and he says, this guy's not a musician. He's pulling information out of another dimension. So these people are kind of all saying the same thing and I'm kind of still always in denial, you know, skepticism is like my weapon to defend myself from like megalomania or, you know, too much ego and trying to stay humble but maybe overdoing it a little bit. And I don't know if I mentioned before that part of Skeleton Man's mission is that we would actually end up in the circle of the Grateful Dead's musicians and that would be like the catalyst to our success. So one day, a guy walks into a bar, the bar that we always play at, and he asks the owner, who is the best Grateful Dead influenced guitarist in the area? And the guy says, well, Illuminostic, but I don't know how to get a hold of him. The girl that had said all the stuff to us about raising consciousness when we played and all that happened to be standing at the bar and did have my phone number. 
She sends me a message saying, hey, can I give this random person your phone number? Normally I'd say no. For some reason I said yes. She gives the guy our phone number and he turns out to have a very wealthy brother who knows Phil Esch from the Grateful Dead. He knows uh, all their backup musicians. He's super connected. And so the guy calls me up and says, I'd like you to play a party at my house. And so oddly, the drummer from Rusted Root is there. I don't know if you guys remember them. They had a big hit in the 90s, kind of like a hippie type band. Uh, so I thought that was a little odd that that guy happened to be there from New York. Like they flew him in just for the party to be the second drummer. And so after the show, the guy says, hey, you guys are really good. I'm going to fly Jay Lane and Robin Sylvester and James Nash up to play a show with you. And I don't want you to open for them. We're actually going to have all of you play together. And so everyone in California has got a story and I'm used to people blowing smoke. If you have even a little bit of talent, everybody's saying, talking about all the things they can do for you. And I'm like, yeah, sure, buddy. I took him a little bit more seriously because the, this drummer from this band, this bigger band was there. But still, I thought, okay, yeah, right. And in case you don't know who Jay Lane is, he was the original drummer in Primus. He played with the members of the Grateful Dead, the surviving members in a band called Further. He was in a band with the rhythm guitarist in the Grateful Dead for 22 years. James Nash was the guitarist from Bob Weir and the Waybacks, who was another member of the Grateful Dead. And Robin Sylvester was always in, also in a band with Bob Weir. Okay, so just as the Skeleton Man had said, we suddenly find ourselves with this offer on the table to go and play a show with these inner circle Grateful Dead musicians and I still didn't believe it until the guy called me and he asked me to meet him and he had a contract he'd rented the venue and I realized this guy is actually serious so we booked a date to play with these Grateful Dead associated people we had Phil Lesh from the Grateful Dead his sound system his sound man the surviving members backing band on stage with us and, and mind you, we hadn't done anything. I mean, we played like a couple of gigs at this point. So to have something like this happen uh, was pretty strange. The only other gig I think we'd play that was significant at all was at the Hog Farm, which is of course another place that's very closely associated in Grateful Dead lore, uh, Wavy Gravy's commune in Northern California. Some of Mickey Hart, one of the drummers from the Grateful Dead, his equipment was on the stage behind us, you know. So everything we had done was inching closer and closer to fulfilling this prophetical thing from this strange hippie that claimed to have met this skeleton. So then I checked the date and I realized just as the skeleton man had said this show that would give birth to our band was nine months probably within a few days to the day of the inception of the band to this gig just like the skeleton man had said. And so unfortunately I came down to Ecuador to visit my mom who committed suicide and that kind of threw me off course and so I just kind of fell apart and left for South America. So we're about six months to the three year mark that the skeleton man said the project would really sprout wings and take off. So we have a little bit of time and you know this is an ongoing story so we'll see if anything more comes of this. It's not exactly like I believe that I'm this musical prophet that's going to pick up the torch the Grateful Dead dropped and single-handedly carry it into the future. I think it's much more likely that the torch that they dropped splintered into a hundred or a thousand pieces. And there are a bunch of people like me out there that are attempting to use music to spread this type of consciousness. Also, it is entirely possible that this is all just coincidence. It's hard for me to imagine that someone calling me with a message that addresses precisely the very specific and obscure topic that I'm thinking about at the very moment that I'm thinking about it. And all of these other coincidences that have conceptual continuity and are so highly improbable, it becomes difficult to not attribute that to some kind of guiding intelligence. And so, where are we at now? Obviously, I hit a bump in the road to put it mildly but at the current juncture I've just made the absolute decision to uh, return to the States and commit to maybe another year or so of really pursuing music professionally and I'm finally at a point in my life where I've overcome my tendencies to self-sabotage uh, I feel like I'm in balance I'm spiritually connected I finally have the discipline that I've been lacking my whole life I'm watching my diet more than ever I'm exercising, I've just become a father, so it's like just in time 
to fulfill this scenario according to the timeline given by the skeleton man and also a couple of other people you know I'm not generally one to go for psychics but people that seem if anyone is capable of these sort of predictions it would be the people that I'm speaking of told me that I would really come into my own at 41 which is about six months from now so it's all very strange and I guess I'm partly mentioning this just because you know one of the functions of this channel is to document this process just in case this all goes somewhere incredible and I think that it will I mean you know the skeleton man is not an isolated incident I've had many many experiences at least this strange and there are lots of videos to come that tell tales that are even more bizarre and I left Virginia telling people that I was going to go and get into the inner circle of Grateful Dead musicians and that consciousness creates our reality and that I was going to master that and pull this off and lo and behold I actually did that and I think the chances of that have got to be pretty much infinitesimal especially if you consider that it's not like I went out and stalked these people or followed them around or hung out at places where they were likely to be over and over again you know when I met Danny Carey from Tool another one of my heroes it was under totally bizarre circumstances and I made a video about that you can check it out but these things all developed organically as if there was a higher mind sort of guiding and even designing the process so that is the real lesson and the real message here that I do very strongly believe that if you find your true purpose your true will and you dedicate to that absolutely it is astounding how strange things can be and how far you can go I will put links in the description of the video of uh, my band playing with these musicians that are associated with the Grateful Dead and also a link to the Skeleton Man group so you guys can check out some of this stuff for yourself and decide what to make of it. Please hit the like button, share, subscribe, and support us on Patreon.